All right, good morning. This is Brian Lysing with Financial Brokerage. I'm a uh, life insurance marketer here. Been here uh, nearly 20 years. Uh, for those of you uh, not familiar with Financial Brokerage, we are a national uh, life annuity, disability, long-term care, and uh, critical illness, Medicare supplement uh, marketing company uh, working with agents and advisors uh, nationwide just like you to help you find the best fits uh, Product-wise, uh, for your clients, and to help with some marketing ideas to get you in in front of more of those those people. Uh, today, we're going to be speaking about the uh, brand new Washington Long-Term Care Trust Act and uh, some of the inner workings of that. And uh, uh, best of all, though, which products are available that uh, your clients can get into. Uh, to qualify for the exemption uh, from this this brand new payroll tax, uh, most of you uh, I see who are are signed on are uh, in the state of Washington or at least licensed in Washington because that's that's where uh, where all of this applies. Uh, so we'll get into this. Um, I do want to thank everybody for joining us. And if you didn't uh, catch the disclaimer earlier, all your lines are muted to cut down on background noise. You can still ask questions, so you can do that uh, and the, uh, through the control panel on your screen. And I'll get to as many of those as possible at the conclusion. Um, in this webinar, we're going to try to answer some of the most commonly asked questions uh, about this act and, and which products apply. And uh, do that rather quickly, uh, but then we're going to get into a little more in-depth uh, analysis of how did we get here, what does the law say, and uh, how did we arrive at, at which products actually fit for this. All right, so here's the Cliff Notes version of the webinar. If you happen to be super busy or something like that, what products can we offer clients? Um, in discussions with many of you over the past few months in the state of Washington, uh, we're probably looking at Mutual of Omaha and John Hancock, their protection-focused products. And then we're just going to add the long-term care rider to those, right? That's one of the most commonly asked questions. There's your answer right there. What products should we use for our clients? So we're just skipping right to the end rather than going through all the details like you see in most webinars. All right. How can we quote these? That's the second most commonly asked question I've been getting. WinFlex Web. Well, we don't have a quoting engine on our website that will do a, a quote comparison of these products, so you have to run the full illustrations. Uh, the companies themselves may have uh, their own software for this, but uh, uh, WinFlex Web works very well. You can use uh, several products within that. Uh, you can create your own username and login for WinFlex Web, or you can ask me. I'm in there all day long, every day, running illustrations. And I can certainly uh, uh, work with you to figure out the client's needs and then prepare the illustration uh, that looks like it's coming from you. All right, so if you wanted the quick version, that's the end of the webinar. Uh, we know which products and we know how to quote them. Uh, but uh, that's really not the end of the webinar. So for those of you that want to understand how we got there, all right, here's the rest of it. Um, first off, though, um, I'm going to put out this little disclaimer. I'm not an attorney. I'm not a tax advisor. I have a lot of fancy letters after my name, but that's not a substitute for, for the letters JD. So, um, you know, this is an insurance uh, person who has read the laws, and these are going to be my interpretations of that. Um, so if uh, you want something more detailed, you'll need to speak to an actual attorney. All right, so a little bit about the, the Washington Long-Term Care Trust Act. Um, it goes into effect officially on July 28, which means on January 1st, uh, people in the state of Washington are going to be subject to a 0.58% payroll tax unless they can demonstrate that they have long-term care insurance in place before November 1st. So that's the exemption that a lot of people are, are trying uh, to uh, try to make sure they have in place before that November 1st date. All right, so some details on, on how to apply for the exemption and, and what counts 
for the exemption. Um, you know, people have to be at least 18, uh, have it before November 1st. Uh, these links here are the places you can go to to see the exact details that uh, I, I pulled some of these excerpts from in the webinar here. Okay, another disclaimer. Uh, even though we can read the law and see what products uh, would exempt the client from the payroll tax, uh, this is something I stole from our, our friends at Pacific Life, is that uh, there's no guarantee that the state will actually grant an exemption to a, a resident, and uh, they actually haven't even worked out all the details and rules uh, for doing that. So a lot of this is still uh, in the works, and it, it looks like a lot of stuff is going to happen uh, very quickly because it will have to <laughs> to meet that November 1st deadline. All right, so back to our, our definition and how we arrived at, at the products that I displayed earlier. I pulled this right off of the, uh, the verbiage that you can get to on, online as well uh, for the law. So uh, clients have to have long-term care coverage in place. How do they define long-term care? Well, in addition to real long-term care policies, uh, it includes uh, life insurance policies uh, or riders that provide long-term care. And uh, something I, I just thought of that I probably should have mentioned earlier, of course, your clients can purchase traditional long-term care to, uh, to cover this. Um, in the, uh, the invitation for the webinar, I, I had some, some verbiage to the effect that uh, many people will probably not uh, want or not prefer traditional long-term care. And, and we've really found that uh, over the years here. Traditional long-term care sales have been uh, diminishing while the life insurance-based policy uh, uh, sales have been uh, going up uh, dramatically. Uh, I think the last stats I saw from LIMRA showed 85, maybe 90 percent of all LTC purchased was on a life insurance chassis. So, uh, you know, people don't like the fact that their premiums uh, can go up with the traditional LTC policy, and uh, history shows us that they will uh, many times. People don't like the fact that uh, they may have a, a long-term care policy, pay on it for years, and never use the benefits. It, it's a possibility. Those people will be in the minority statistically, but it's possible. With a life insurance policy, uh, in many cases, we can guarantee the premiums will always remain level, and of course, we know a benefit will be paid out whether they use the LTC uh, part or not. All right, so getting back to the life insurance based uh, solutions, which is what we're covering here, what I think most people will, will prefer. Um, we know that life insurance based policies will count for the law. Uh, there are some exceptions though. So one exception is that uh, if the policy requires permanent institutional confinement, that will not count. So some of the uh, uh, early chronic illness riders had extra verbiage in there that said, uh, hey, to qualify, you have to lose abilities, and that ability loss has to be permanent. Most companies have removed that, but there are still a few out there. So um, I would personally interpret that as, as uh, those type of riders would, would not count because uh, of the permanent language there. Um, other policies that won't count would be those that provide a lump sum payment for those benefits. So there's a few chronic illness writers out there that uh, one I, I can think of in particular pays an 80% uh, of the face amount benefit as a lump sum. There's your benefit. So that would not count under the law. Uh, some of these, uh, an, an, another item that would not count would be uh, if they condition the benefits on actual receipt of long-term care. Uh, I would interpret that as uh, an indemnity benefit. You know, once you uh, uh, qualify due to loss of abilities, you trigger the benefit to be paid out to you. It doesn't matter who's providing the care or where it's being provided. You just get a check because you've lost those abilities. So, uh, reading uh, the verbiage of the law, uh, an indemnity benefit would not count. So that leaves us with reimbursement style benefits, and uh, almost all of those. Uh, involve a, a true LTC rider. So which companies offer the true LTC riders? Which ones offer 
chronic illness riders. I mean, if we look at the universe of all the life insurance companies we have here at Financial Brokerage that offer some some form of, of all of the above, uh, just about all of our companies have something available. And, um, you know, some of these you'll, you'll certainly recognize and have probably written business through them. Once we distill it down to the companies that uh, would quali- have riders that would qualify under the law, we lose a lot. And now we're down to just eight companies that have qualifying long-term care riders available to our clients. So a little bit of, of detail. I mentioned chronic illness riders and true LTC riders. What, what, what does all that really mean, right? Uh, I mean, to the client, they're not paying any attention to this, really. All they know is they have long-term care coverage on their policy. Well, at, at the carrier level and, and certainly at the State Department of Insurance level, it, it makes a little bit of a difference. So uh, the, uh, the chronic illness riders, these are what we most commonly see it's filed under tax code 101G. Some of the earliest ones included that permanent ability loss language in the rider. Most of the companies have taken that away now, so we don't have to worry about it. But uh, you'll see a lot of insurance companies use this rider because it has uh, less expenses associated with it uh, on the company's part, so they don't have to uh, pay as much to administer those riders. Uh, The true LTC riders filed under a different tax code. Uh, A couple things you need to note as the the riding uh, agent here is that one, you have to have a health license. Uh, Some people I've encountered have just a life license, not the combined life and health. Make sure you have that health component uh, with your insurance license. And uh, the part that everybody forgets is the long-term care continuing ed. Uh, That's uh, something you have to keep current uh, usually every two years. And you do have to have that current to sell the true LTC rider. Now, within those riders, a company could choose to design um, a policy in a way where the LTC benefit exceeds the death benefit. Now, we don't see that on the chronic illness type of products. And then most importantly for our purposes today, the Washington law specifies this type of of rider, the true LTC rider. So those eight companies that we saw earlier, they all have that true LTC rider available. Now, how do we get down to those just two companies that I showed at the very beginning of the webinar. Well, we can break it down by short pay and, and multi-pay type of products. Uh, the short pay products, in fact, the, the next screen, I'll make a good argument for why you would want to use these if you're able to. But uh, these represent what were really the earliest hybrid products on the market where they were meant as uh, sort of uh, asset-based long-term care policies where the client had a lump sum, they could move it into one of these products, uh, build up some cash value. There was a death benefit associated with it and also a, a long-term care benefit. Now, those have uh, since developed into not just single pay products, but uh, short pays where a client could uh, opt to pay over 10 years, five years, in some cases, even 20 years uh, to have a, a life insurance based LTC plan. Now, because of the, the short pay requirements, um, not everybody is, is going to do this. They're not going to, uh, to be able to afford the premiums. We typically see these with people who are nearing retirement age or maybe just newly retired and their income levels uh, are such where uh, they could afford this or they have built up some assets already to move into one of these products. Uh, if a client can do it, I highly recommend looking at those. Um, in speaking with many of you and, and running quotes and illustrations uh, so far, most of the people interested in uh, you know, the exemption, uh, they're not in that category. <laughs> they're going to have to look at something where they're paying a premium continuously, you know, probably for the rest of their lives. And uh, I guess one thing to note, uh, One America, they do have a, a multi-pay product. Their, their whole life plan could be paid for a client's entire lifetime. Uh, but, uh, you know, we don't see as much of that as we do the multi-pay products that are listed there. So 
looking at, at the multi-pay products, usually when we're looking at something permanent for clients, uh, in the past we've looked at a GUL, Guaranteed Universal Life, where the client pays a set premium and their death benefit is guaranteed to be there for the rest of their life as long as they pay the premium every time on time. They take no loans, take no withdrawals. Uh, you know, they don't do something that will that'll screw it up. It can run on zero cash value forever and ever. And that's the end of the story. Turns out that those four companies on the right that offer true LTC riders, they no longer offer GUL products. So what sort of, of ULs are these? Um, I'm going to skip ahead here. They are all IULs, Index Universal Life. And uh, those IULs come in two flavors generally. We have accumulation products or protection-based products. And uh, all four of these have accumulation IULs. Uh, some of you have sold these. Some of you, this, this may be new to you. And if, if that's the case, we typically uh, look at an accumulation-focused IUL uh, where a client wants to put some money away in a place where they can later access those dollars uh, in a tax-free manner, usually in their retirement years. And our goal here with these products is usually to push in as much money as possible while keeping the death benefit as low as possible while maintaining the favorable tax status. Um, so that's a different kind of sale. Uh, if you're getting into retirement planning with your clients, this may be something to consider. Uh, what I found with uh, illustrating many of these so far is that uh, that's not where these clients are at. <laughs> They're typically looking for uh, the protection and, and getting that uh, LTC benefit. So in that case, we're going to be looking at the protection-focused uh, IULs, which uh, are offered by Mutual Omaha and also by, uh, by John Hancock. Now, what's a protection-focused IUL, and how does that differ, differ from an uh, accumulation-focused IUL? Well, the protection-focused IULs are really trying to do the job of a GUL uh, without those expensive underlying guarantees. Uh, the insurance companies have to reserve a lot more money uh, when they offer a, a GUL, so we've seen a lot of the companies get out of that market and, and the prices uh, have become a, a little bit more expensive. Uh, you know, roughly you can get a client into a protection IUL for 15 or 20 percent less than a comparable GUL and it's still going to last for the client's lifetime. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide here that uh, I, I stole this directly from uh, our friends at, at AIG. So with a, a GUL, what we, we look at on those illustrations a lot of times is a, a ledger column that shows what would happen if the insurance company went to their maximum cost of insurance charges and a uh, client got the minimum interest rate or in many cases a 0% interest rate. Right? And, and it really doesn't matter if any of those things happen with the GUL because the policy is always going to remain in force. You're relying on an underlying guarantee uh, to make that happen. It's, it's sort of like the, the part of the iceberg that's below uh, the uh, ocean level. You don't see it, but it's huge and it's supporting everything else. Well, with the protection-focused IUL, we really don't need to pay for that underlying guarantee. And, and here's why. We're using an index rate of return to keep this policy in force. So we're relying on usually the S&P 500 over a, a long period of time. So the illustrations will still show you that 0% column, right? And they will usually uh, cause the policies to lapse in the client's 80s, maybe about uh, age 90 or so. Um, don't be alarmed when you see that. And, and here's why. Has that ever happened? You know, if, if you're relying on the stock market, for three, four, five decades. What are the chances of the client getting a 0% return for that long of a period of time? Well, historically, it has never happened. If we look back at the worst 30-year period in U.S. stock market history, and if you had money in the market, 
you actually would have seen a, a positive return of 2.8%. Now that includes the Great Depression. I mean, pretty bad, right? If, if we relive that period of time over and over again, you, you still would have seen a 2.8%. Uh, you wouldn't have seen a 0% rate of return. So 0% is historically um, unprecedented. Now, since we're in an index, you wouldn't actually get the 2.8%. Uh, AIG did this analysis based on a 9% cap on the S&P 500 uh, annual point to point. And in that same time period, you would have seen a positive 4.5% rate of return. So we could relive the worst 30 years in, in stock market history over and over again. Still not see zero. We'd be at 4.5%. Most of these protection-focused IULs are illustrating 1% to 2% higher than that right now. So, I mean, they're not too far right now, um, illustration-wise, from that historical worst-case scenario. So what I'm getting at here is you can feel very comfortable looking at those illustrations, looking at the, the current ledgers, and, and feel comfortable that your client isn't going to have to worry about paying more money in later or the policy lapsing. Uh, now, if you really want to look at a historical worst case scenario, go in and change the interest rate to this 4.5% right here and, and see what it does. Uh, because that would represent a, again, a historical worst case scenario. All right, so that's the, the protection focused IULs. Again, we're, we have to use those because of the type of rider that's available. Those companies just don't have. Uh, the GULs. So, and in looking at the two companies here, uh, again, these are the two that we started with. These are the two that have the protection focused IULs with us here at Financial Brokerage. We have John Hancock, we have Mutual of Omaha. Which one should I use for my clients? Well, I've been running a lot of these illustrations, and I can tell you that the pricing is very, very close between these two. Um, one of these is not consistently lower than the other, and they're usually, you know, maybe one to two percent in in premium uh, apart from one another. So it, it's really about a toss-up from a price standpoint. Uh, there are some unique features to the two companies' products that may uh, be more attractive to one client than another. So uh, with John Hancock, they offer the Vitality Rider. And some of you may be familiar with that. Uh, it's a health and wellness program that uh, gives a client the ability to reduce their cost of insurance charges over time. Uh, they can also earn some extra cash, some extra prizes. Uh, give you an example, they get a free Fitbit once they sign up. They have the ability to purchase an Apple Watch for as little as $25. They can get discounts on healthy food. Uh, discounts at some uh, online outdoor outfitters and earn all sorts of cash prizes along the way. Uh, for some people that are, are willing to, to monitor that and participate, um, you know, some clients have actually come out ahead and, and made money in excess of their, their premiums paid uh, off of that sort of thing. Uh, but some people, it will be too confusing. So, you know, assess your, your clients accordingly. Uh, you don't have to put that rider uh, on a product uh, if the client doesn't want it, but it is available. Uh, Hancock also offers a non-index uh, UL, uh, so the protection UL. We don't have to worry about uh, describing how an index works, uh, but then that is relying on a fixed uh, interest rate, so that's an option. And um, they do offer this to clients below age 30. Why is that important? Well, because a company on the right, Mutual of Omaha, minimum age for the LTC rider is 30. So anybody in their 20s, we're going to have to look at, at John Hancock. Um, some uh, items that distinguish the Mutual Omaha product, uh, they have a guaranteed refund option. And uh, this might come into play with some of your clients who don't know if they're going to uh, work their entire careers in the state of Washington. If they move out, then you know, they no longer uh, would have access to that, that LTC plan. So, you know what, maybe they want something in place where, you know, they can qualify for the exemption, they have the coverage while they're there, 
but if they don't need it or don't want it, they want something else down the road, they can get all of their money back for this. The people that are paying the tax, they're not going to get <laughs> their money back. So uh, with Mutual of Omaha in years 20 through 25, you can choose to surrender the policy and get all of your premiums back, uh, provided you've met the funding requirements uh, prior to that point. Uh, now, Mutual of Omaha also has a chronic illness rider that is uh, automatically included in the policy. Uh, I know we mentioned earlier that those riders don't count for the, the exemption under the law. That's fine. We're putting on the LTC rider that does count. This is just an added bonus that it's up to the client if they want to exercise that rider uh, eventually, uh, whether they're in Washington or, or somewhere else. Um, the law doesn't specify which sort of rider you use when you exercise it, just that you have to have that, um, have that there and have access to it. So a uh, couple minor differences there uh, between the two products. And now I'm going to go back a few slides because I skipped over some details on the short pay products. So if you recall, we've got uh, four companies that offer five pay, 10 pay, even single pay life-based LTC policies. We usually see these um, purchased by folks around retirement age. Uh, however, I would highly recommend these uh, for anybody as long as they have the cash flow to pay them. And, and it, here's an example of why. So I took a look at a 40-year-old uh, and we looked at a uh, $360,000 total LTC benefit, um, which equates to $5,000 a month in, in LTC. And uh, ran the numbers with both styles of, of products. And if we look at the short pay product, our, our client's paying $5,700 a year, but he's done in 10 years. He's paid in 57 grand, and that's it for the rest of his life. Now, if he goes with the continuous pay product model, He's paying less than half of that premium. So that might look a little bit more appealing, but he's going to pay this for the rest of his life at that rate. And if he makes it to age 105, he's paid in more than double what he would have paid in for the short pay product. Um, you know, so how long does your client think they're, they're going to live? <laughs> you know, um, or when are they going to need long term care? Uh, I actually calculated out the crossover age and uh, you know, th this doesn't assume uh, we didn't use anything uh, with the time value of money so just a straight dollar to dollar uh, crossover age and that happens to be age 63 so uh, prior to age 63 the client would have been better off they would have paid in less money with the continuous pay product after age 63 they would have paid in less money with the short pay all you have to ask your client at that point in time is, at, at what age do you think you're going to need long-term care or pass away? If you think that those events are going to happen well after age 63, then you'd be better off with the short pay product. You'll pay in a lot less money over the course of your lifetime. So that's probably a conclusion that most folks would come to. They envision themselves maybe in their 80s or 90s. Uh, for, for both of those events happening. Uh, but you know what, cash flow is a big deal, especially with, with younger clients. So again, not everybody's gonna go for those short pay uh, type of products, even though in the long run, I, I think it's, it's really the better deal for them. All right, so I think that is the conclusion of the webinar. In fact, it is. So yeah, we'll open it up for questions here in, in just a second. But uh, yeah, I want to thank everybody for joining us uh, here this morning. And uh, you know what, we have just a few months to take advantage of this opportunity to help out those clients that would like to qualify uh, for the exemption. Uh, keep in mind, there's underwriting turnaround uh, to, uh, to deal with. So if somebody's applying in October, they better be really clean and healthy and uh, have everything together or they might not have that policy uh, in force uh, by November 1st. So the uh, best thing you can do is reach out to all of your, all of your clients. Uh, the sooner the, <laughs> the better and uh, start these discussions because uh, 
you know, they've got to get through the underwriting process. So uh, we'll take a look here and see what, uh, what sort of questions we have.